So people have said that by watching this program, they're like getting better than art school inf information in a shorter amount of time. Now today, I'm going to introduce you to a hot young superstar that everybody's buzzing about. And you may not have heard of him yet. A lot of people have. And he is a rock star painting. And Patrick, what are you going to teach us today? Hey, Eric, I'm going to tell you one thing that hardly anyone ever talks about that will make more of an impact on your progress as a painter than possibly anything else. But you're, so, okay, I just got to, I got to get this right. You're going to tell me one thing. It's one, one thing I've been thing. doing for a decade. You're show me one thing that's going to make me a better painter and nobody ever talks about it. Basically. What is it? What is it? Uh, I'll show you in a bit. All right. Okay. Well, I'm anxious to get started. Let's go. <laughs> it's Art School Live with Eric Rose. Now, here's your host, Eric Rose. Welcome to Art School Live. I'm Eric Rhodes from Fine Art Connoisseur, Plan Air Magazine, and lots of other stuff. And Today, we've got a, a hot young superstar on. His name is Patrick Okersinski. It's a tough one to say, but you're going to hear that name more and more. But when you see this guy's work, you're going to be blown away. I mean, let me show you. Uh, he is uh, at a very high level as a painter for the amount of time he's been on this earth. And I got to tell you that I've been painting a long time. I don't know that I could stand up to his work. I mean, he's just incredible. Now, he may have started young, but he is, and he's still young, he's under 30, and he's an incredible painter, and he's going to tell you something he discovered that actually is going to help you become a better painter. So you want to hang in there for that today. Now, we have a prize. If you put a comment in the comment box, even if you never, never do it any other time, and we uh, pick your name, and hopefully you'll say, like, I'm Eric from Austin, Texas, you know, don't say that, but say something like that. Uh, you have a chance to win the easel brush clip, which is a great thing for your, you know, keep your brushes right there front and center. Uh, so you're not dropping them on the ground or on the floor. Uh, I, I keep two of them on my studio easel uh, so that I'm not, uh, I, I, I put the brushes I use and sometimes I'll separate the warm brushes and cool brushes when I'm working on something like that. The winner of the last prize, Janet Wright in Medina, Ohio, won the value specs. We have for you a book. Uh, it is 240. That's a lot. Plein air painting tips. If you want to learn about landscape painting and, and getting outside and landscape painting, go to plenairlive.com slash 240 and get that uh, for free. Now, if you uh, are new to this, welcome. We're glad you're here. We have been here every single day since COVID started. When the, when the pandemic started, when the quarantine started, we came here and we did seven days a week for seven months in a row. And then we went to five days in a week and we've been doing it ever since. So welcome. If you're new, we're going to teach you all kinds of things about art. You can subscribe to this program on YouTube by going to YouTube, searching Art School Live or by name. And then uh, you can also follow me on Instagram at Eric Rhodes. Okay, now, Patrick, we are very excited to learn what you're going to do. So now you got to tell us what, what's going on. Cool. Uh, let me just adjust this. Welcome to my little studio. Yeah. It's, I like uh, it. Very, very humble beginnings, but you know, I've got no, 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 you know, we, we, uh, we don't judge. Awesome. Uh, cool. So the thing I'm going to talk about today is master copies. This painting it's my painting in a sense, but it's not actually my painting because that's a know, Levitan, isn't it? It's a Shishkin. Shishkin. Well, I'm sorry. I well, have, I know I have right. a Levitan up in. Uh, I actually should take it because it's one of my favorite paintings. All right. Well, one thing that I'll mention uh, while he's getting that painting this is, is uh, Levitan. If you could see it, it's a oh, uh, whirlpool. It's yeah. actually, you know, in real life, it's two meters big, but. You know, my copy is a lot smaller. It's so I want to tell you guys, uh, for everybody who's listening, and, and we're going to get into this with Patrick, but um, we're going to talk about why master copying will change your work. But there's a couple of rules about master copies. Okay? Do you know what they are, Patrick? Uh, 
If you make one the same size, don't tell the authorities. <laughs> if you make one the same size, you are actually committing fraud. You're actually breaking the law, right? Uh, and especially if you try to sell it as an original. So uh, the rule the museums have is if you go to a museum and you're allowed to do a master copy in person, which they let you do in Russia and they do it a lot of places, you're not allowed to do it the same size. That's the first thing. The second thing is you cannot ever try to pass it off as your own. So you cannot put your signature on the front. What you can do is you can write uh, the words after Levitan. Uh, or after Shishkin, or whoever the artist is, but you have to write the words after on there. I mean, that's the protocol. And you can, on the back of that painting, you can say, this is a master copy I did of Levitan trying to teach. Now, a lot of people frown on the idea of selling master copies, uh, but that what's most important, and I've sold master copies, what's most important is that you're honest about it, you know, because you're trying to learn from it. So let's talk about master copying, Patrick. What have you got to tell us? Cool. Well, I don't think I've ever uh, sold a master copy of my own. I kind of like to make them and have them around the house instead of my own artwork. I totally uh, agree. <laughs> so, you know, this, this frame is still unfinished, but, you know, it's going to be in the dining room very soon. Uh, I have this Emilio Sanchez Perrier that I stole from the dining room uh, right now. And... So these are paintings that I've been working on more recently, but I always I wasn't always working on paintings like these. My the first master copies I ever did were actually really, really humble. I think uh you know, we I sent some images of some of the first master copies I ever did. They were actually done digitally on Photoshop before I was even painting with oils and a brush okay so, so here's what here's one right it's this yeah one? so that was about eight years ago i had just gotten into college i just got out of high school i thought i wanted to go into illustration i didn't really know about the fine art world but i knew that i wanted to learn to draw and i had already known by then because it's an exercise that i already been doing for a few years that one of the most important ways to learn was to study the masters, study those who had already figured it out. And so master copies, and so both of these are by Sargent, then there are also some uh, landscape master copies in there. Uh, you know, master copies, you can do them in any medium, you can do them in any size, and you can do them at any level of refinement. So you don't have to make a huge painting that takes you weeks and weeks like this. I'm doing it because I'm at a certain stage in my career when I want to figure out how to make paintings like that. And so that's what I'm trying to study from masters like Shishkin or Leviton or others. I just, uh, just the last few weeks, I was actually at the Metropolitan for their copyist program. And I've been copying this just amazing painting by Albert Bierstadt. I think there's an image of that. Yeah, that's okay. it. It's been just a great experience and I've learned so much and really, really nuanced things, but you don't have to start there. That's where I am right now. Okay. You I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. And uh, let's see here if I can put myself on screen. Uh, this is a master copy. Oh, I boy. did uh, third, 25 years ago. It's not very good, but it was a uh, uh, Jerome painting. And the reason I did it is because I wanted to learn from it. And, uh, you know, now that I can paint, I, it doesn't hold up as well as it did, but it was something that was uh, an important lesson. So talk to me about the nuances that you get when you're learning to master copy, because a lot of people are, are going to be like, well, why should I bother? Why should I go through this? I, I'm going to track it back to, you know, what it was like doing master copies as a beginner. So one of the issues you have as a beginner is, you know, you know, you know, you want to figure out how to paint, but you don't know the subject matter. Maybe you're stuck at home. Maybe you can't go to all these beautiful locations. So you could copy from a photograph or you could set up a still life. But the thing that master copies offer as an exercise for an absolute beginner, for someone that doesn't, you know, that's really just stepping into the world of art and painting and learning the chops is it's almost a foolproof exercise 
So you already have a painting that you love and admire and you know you want to learn from it. And it's as if the language is already there. You know, painting is a visual language. And so if you're trying to learn just the chops of painting, the words, the grammar, like how to form a sentence, how to form a painting, how to make something hang and work. If you're copying a painting, there's almost no way you can go wrong. You know, you're going to be exposed to great art, to painting that's way above your pay scale that, you know, you don't quite understand what you're appreciating just yet. But just by doing the copies and by exposing yourself over time, you're not just going to get better at painting. You're going to learn all the little technicalities about composition and color and edge work. But a big part of doing copies is just exposing yourself to good painting and developing your taste. So and a little so feedback on that. Just. Mm -hmm. Yes, Eric. Eric is actually, he had a little technical issue, so you can go ahead with your presentation. Okay, I'll keep going. Hey, I dropped out for a second. I hit the wrong button. I apologize. But when, when you're copying a master painting, uh, one of the things that I think is so important is you're copying, right? And so you want to really strive not to make it your own. You want to learn from the artist. You, you know, you're, you're there to figure out what they're doing. And what I found is that um, if I copy something that's a masterwork once or twice a year, even though I've been painting now for 25 years, um, the things that I learned from copying that master painting 20 years ago, I'm going to notice a lot of things I didn't even pay attention to then. You mentioned edges, for instance, right? So I, I would look at a painting and try to copy it, but I didn't even think about edges, and so I didn't even notice the edges. But today, edges are everything for me. So little things like that. But the other thing I noticed, Patrick, is when painting a face, I struggled with this one. I was copying a Winter Halter, who was a great German portrait artist. And I, I noticed that one little tiny change uh, that was probably an eighth of an inch of an indent uh, changed the, the painting from looking fat to thin. Just to, and And... It was something that that artist had figured out that I never knew. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I've done the exact same thing. Uh, so one of those images I had of the portraits I've done, because I do a little bit of portraiture, even though I'm primarily a landscape painter, was this portrait of Sargent. I went back and a few years later, I copied, uh, you know, the exact same one. And so I think there might be like four years of a difference and it's night and day. Uh, it's tough to see with the glare, but it's the painting of Henry James by John Singer Sargent. Um, yeah, so even copying the exact same painting, you're spot on. You'll notice uh, very, very different things. And so, you know, how you can start doing copies. I, I've done copies in a lot of different ways, not just like the full painting. I've done much smaller copies and often working smaller and doing smaller copies is a much more easy and accessible way. And so for instance, I don't always do them in oil. Sometimes I do them in my sketchbooks with pencil. So I have a few of my sketchbooks here to show what those look like. Okay. Are you going to actually do some copying today? I, maybe at the end, All right. I could uh, go into yeah, okay. it. But so, yeah. You know, sometimes when I copy, I really focus in on just one aspect of what I want to learn from the artist. So, so if you if you were on a mission to get better at trees, since you have tree painting behind you, you could that, in theory big... you you could in theory then just say, All right, I'm just gonna go from Shishkin to Levitan to Scott Christensen to Clyde Aspavig. I'm just gonna copy their trees just so I can learn how they do it. Yeah. Yeah, that that's basically it. And it it sounds deceptively easy, but it 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 really is that. When you are copying master paintings, you will soak it in no matter what you do. Yeah. It's I I really think it's a foolproof exercise and you know, I went to an academy and I was uh studying there, you know, doing figurative art at the Florence Academy of Art and 
when I first went there, I was really surprised that not that many people were doing copies. And I think, uh, I don't know if I can take some credit, but, you know, after my first year that they actually put copies into the program as a part-time class over. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> if you go to the Sirikov Institute in Moscow uh, or to any of the Royal Academy of Fine Art uh, training in throughout Russia, part of what you're required to do is master copies. Yeah, which I, I think that's probably how it should be. And yeah. historically, in, uh, you know, in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, I think half of the curriculum was doing master copies either at the Louvre, which was one of the main reasons for the Louvre's existence in the late 1700s, early 1800s. It was for artists to be able to make good copies yeah. and learn and, you know, to almost develop, yeah. you know, the artists of Paris and France and to bring the artwork up. So if you were doing a copy, I, you're going to show us your sketchbook here in a second, but if you were doing a copy of, that uh fashion or, or that that levitan painting there or shishkin i guess you said w would you try to figure out what his palette is or would you just use the palette that you're accustomed to so uh for this painting i was trying to figure out what he was doing in his palette when i'm painting in my studio especially i have a very extended palette which is similar to what uh, what I could find about Shishkin, he used a very extended palette. He used a lot of earth colors, uh, burnt umber, raw umber, uh, burnt raw sienna, yellow ochres, uh, Venetian, English reds, you know, all different sorts of things. And then also more chromatic colors, uh, the equivalent of what we have today as cadmiums and ultramarines and cobalts and Prussian blues. So, you know, his palette, it really ran the gamut. And so that was something I was studying. And I, I was going back and researching what his unfinished paintings might look like, what he probably did to achieve a painting of that finish. He was probably working in stages. So he probably had a detailed drawing and then an underpainting and then a layer or two over that, but still painting very directly. So that for a painting for a copy like this, that is all a consideration. And for the copy I've been working on at the Met, I've really been reading up about Bierstadt and really closely looking at the painting and looking at how the paint is layered and how he uses texture and what he probably did to achieve all the effects he did. So for me right now, that is something I'm looking at. Uh, it's not something I always was looking at though, because it's not something that I could always see. But now, even though I've been, you know, it's been years since I've graduated from the academy and I've been more or less working as an emerging artist, I'm still doing them because I still think there's so much to learn and you know, I still admire them. And well, there's a guy in the, I think it's a guy in the comments who says, I'm trying to find out where he studied, but uh, Alaki Akelovich Brash Manchkin, I probably butchered it uh, because it's Akelovich. That means he's Russian. Cause that's probably his father's name. Likewise. He said he was not allowed to uh, paint an original work for seven years when he studied. Hmm. Um, maybe just, you don't have, just don't, you don't have to judge. <laughs> just tell, I'm just telling you what he said. <laughs> That's interesting. You know, people have different, all sorts of different ideas and how you should start, but I started doing master copies very early on and, but yeah, uh, none of these copies were from a live painting as the guest said. So that's not too dissimilar. You know, I was working okay. for reproductions. Now, because there's a number of people who yeah. just tuned in, I want to show a little bit of your work, and I want you to tell me if these are originals or master copies. Okay. All right. All right. That's an original. Original. Yeah. Uh, original. 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 Those rocks are amazing, by the way. Thank you. Original. And you told me that was a plein air piece. <laughs> so so that's a that's a piece from this summer. And it was a plein air piece. I think I spent four to five hours on it. And the funny story of it was I went down to this pond and it was about 12 in the afternoon. And I had really been looking at and being inspired by the works of George Innes and Sanford Gifford, which are very famous American painters from the 1800s. Hudson River so, School, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, with them in the back of my mind, I 
created this sunset painting oh, inspired by the scene. I was working outdoors. I was taking the trees and arranging them. And, you know, in, in some ways that painting, some people might call that a master, master copy because it was so heavily influenced by the works of Sanford Gifford and right. George Innes right. in a way. But so, you made up the light. I made that up. <laughs> it, it was because that's I, not twelve noon. No, I I have a picture of it out there. It's buried in my Instagram, but it's you know just that painting set up on the easel and it's clear blue sky in the background. It's uh. So did you did you change the the light when you were on location, or did you do it after you got back home? On on location, you I did. started. So what's that like? Because you know this is something a lot of the tonalists do. Is you know they they use the the scene for the inspiration, but they completely changed the tone and the light. Yeah. I, yeah, in a sense, and George Innes' later works were very tonalist. You know, he started out in the Hudson River School, but then towards the late, late 1800s, he got a little bit like that. Um, yeah, no, I mean, you're definitely spot on. I sort of had an idea of what I wanted it to look like. And the way I started it, it was very... It's actually really easy. It was mostly a raw umber wash. And so most of the trees in that painting, you'll see it's painted relatively transparently and a lot of uh, burnt umber and then a little bit of cools in the left side and more warm reds in the middle under where the sun uh, should be setting. But so it was a surprisingly straightforward painting to make. It's very limited and restrained. And so after I figured out the drawing in raw umber, I went in, I added the sky, I painted the reflection exactly the same, except it's slightly darker yellows, but lighter shadows because, mm -hmm. you know, eventually you get to a point in your career when, or as a painter, you know how light works and you know the gradient of the sky and you know how water reflections work. They're darker, except in the darkest parts where they're actually a little bit lighter. And so you can start playing around with that in a sense. Okay. All right, so let's see some of those sketches. Cool. Uh, so, and, you know, these are only a couple sketchbooks that I found because I have pages and pages and pages of these more uh, everywhere. So, you know, these are some compositional master, uh, master studies that I would do. So that would be Edgar Payne? I think some of these are. Yeah. Uh, I wrote the names down. I have uh, Compton, so E. Harrison Compton. I definitely have uh, read Edgar Payne's book. It's worth its weight in gold. It's one of the best books out there. And I definitely have copied his paintings, but I don't know if these ones are his per se. But so the way I go about copying these is uh, the way I think about the composition. I'm looking at the big masses and the big lines and looking at uh, just the different arrangements of all these different lines. And so, you know, each one of these little sketches is probably 10 to 15 minutes. In a way, it's a little bit of an exercise in drawing, but it's mostly an exercise in composition because most of the work is actually happening in my mind. I'm thinking about the composition. I'm being exposed to the composition. I'm seeing how their composition works. I'm dissecting whether or not they're working in tonal masses or maybe line or maybe foreground, middle, background, because you know, the way people thought about composition through the ages is also different. It also depends on the artist. Most yep. people today think about masses, and that's uh, an approach from Edgar Payne. You know, he's thinking about his masses, and he's also thinking about the line and the different structures, wh whether something's a steelyard composition or a circular thing, things like that. Okay. Um, then I have some... I have a smaller sketchbook. And so this is a sketchbook I use with me. It's been sitting on my uh, shelf. But, you know, before I was a full-time artist, I worked a job as a valet for six years out of high school. So you're supporting yourself as an artist now? Um, it, It's my main source of income. I keep a low overhead. But, you know, it's been, uh, it's been going. Good. You know, just being bored at work. I take uh, my little sketchbook, and so that's a copy of a Ramon Casas drawing. Uh -huh. And so, you know, if you're just somewhere and you're bored, you could just take out a little sketchbook. That's a sergeant uh, drawing. 
that I copied. Well, those little them. moleskins are wonderful. I keep those in my back pocket all the time. Yeah. And, you know, it helps you stay active and stay dry. Yeah. And so. Well, you should always be drying. That's, okay. that's what they say. Yeah. And then, you know, to more uh, refined copies. Oh, you know, these are more of the same. Just dozens and dozens of little compositions. Hold it still. Yeah. All right. So you're in that case, you're trying to figure out composition. Yeah. Yeah. We just posted a link to the Edgar Payne composition book in the um, in the chat. Okay, there's a Velasquez. Yeah, so uh, that's the Juan de Pereja. Very nice copy. You know, and you know, even if you're doing a copy like that where it's a pencil drawing of a oil portrait, you're still being exposed to the painting. You're studying the line. You're studying the drawing composition, and so even that is a really great exercise. And the next exercise, which I've done dozens and dozens of when I had to actually learn how to paint in oils because I didn't start painting in oils, but working small and doing small copies was a really important exercise for me just to get me comfortable with the medium of oil painting. So, you know, these are about, I don't know, a dozen and a half of these little five by sevens that I would just sit down and do tons of, you know, I have Isaac Leviton. I have a lot of Leviton cause he was a big influence on me. And are you copying him out of books? Uh, books or computer screens. Yeah. Okay. And in both cases, they're photographs. And so they're, they're not necessarily going to read exactly like the paintings. I have a buddy who owns a Leviton and uh, I'd, I'd like to go steal it. But I, I don't steal. So, I gosh, I can't blame you. I think you know he's been. Uh, he was one of my favorite painters. So you know these these copies were done at a very small scale, and what I was base mostly focused on was trying to have a smaller thumbnail of the painting, and I was focusing on uh, mostly accurate color and semi accurate drawing, and these were really an exercise to just soak in landscape painting in a sense. Right. I wasn't focusing on making a full finished painting, but I wanted, I was interested in the full image of the painting, but not on the full scale in a sense, you know, because sure. if you're working a painting like that, there are all these other considerations that you need to start accounting for. But when you limit yourself to a small scale, you'll still figure out, uh, Primarily the color mixing, a little bit of the composition, a little bit of the drawing, but you know, mostly these are color studies in a sense. Yeah. Well, that's a really great way to do it. Also, you're going to get more frustrated on a bigger piece. Yeah. My, my first copies were these giant paintings. It was really hard. Oh, wow. Yeah. You got a lot. These aren't all copies. A lot of these are from life, but yeah. I really stand by, you know, little five by seven sketches. Right. It's, uh, it's a great way to really get a lot of mileage when you're starting out as a painter and, you know, focus on the full composition and just the full color. So, you know, doing little master's copies on a tiny scale like this. Yeah, it's uh, it's good stuff. And well, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like the Kevin McPherson theory. I'm sure it's not original, but he always talks about when you're learning to plan air paint. Go out, give yourself 30 minutes and paint small eight by tens or smaller. And really, if you really want to get a lot of progress, then paint a lot of master copies. I never really thought about that. I've painted, you know, a few over the years, but yeah, I think that's a great thing. If you really want to ramp up, you probably would see a lot of progress if you painted 30 master copies in, you know, in six months or a year or something. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I've heard about, I've heard the quote from Kevin McPherson because I have his books actually. And I, I couldn't agree more with that idea. And the idea of that uh, repetition and just getting your mileage and doing a lot of starts, I think it's really important. I think a lot of people are probably really familiar with the analogy of uh, the pottery class and the professor that split his class and let themselves decide which group that they'd be in to the students that would be graded on the amount of pots 
just the pounds of clay that they've thrown by the end of the term. Yeah. And the students that spent the entire term working on one perfect pot. And what you would see is that these students would spend just months working on just one pot. And the students that came in every single day made something new, tried something different, learned something. Uh, by the end, they were just miles ahead. Well, we have, a, we have a video out uh, called The Master's Touch or something like that. It's about chunk learning. Uh, we did it with Brian Mark Taylor. And the idea of chunk learning is exactly what you're saying, is that rather than trying to do all pieces of everything, like, you know, let, let's use painting as an example. Rather than trying to do the whole painting 30 or 40 times, do that one tree 30 or 40 times till you get it perfect, till you can do it in your sleep, till you can do it almost instinctively, and then move on to the next subject matter, what you know, a cloud or whatever, and get it. Keep copying that because that's where you grow the fastest. You know, the there is the Malcolm Gladwell well theory of 10,000 hours, but that mastery can be accomplished faster by chunking. Mm -hmm. That's that's really interesting. I think uh, I think that has a lot of overlap, but I've never heard it quite explained that way. And I I guess you know the compositional studies that I showed earlier; those are kind of chunking composition. Would you say? Yep. Yep, yeah, they so, are. You know, I I can get behind that for sure. Okay, um, what's next? Well, so I guess I could show some of the more uh refined paintings you know those were some of the paintings i did earlier on and really i don't do that many master copies at that scale anymore most of those paintings were done five six five four years ago and eventually eventually you come to a point where you're comfortable with certain things you know you're comfortable doing a color study. You could get it, you can nail it in an hour or two hours if you really sat down for it. And so it's like, okay, what's next as an artist? Like how else, you know, could you grow? And then you start looking more towards more refined work or larger work per se. You know, so I would do uh, larger scale master copies. So, you know, this is a bit larger than those other ones. This is a Spanish artist, Carlo, Car uh, Carlos de Jais, how, however you might spell that. So, uh, you know, little eight by 12, but even this is a step up from there. And at this stage, it starts to inform some of my larger paintings. I say larger, I'm about to pull up a nine by 12. But so, you know, a little painting like, like this. It's you know, lovely. It's, yeah, it's, you know, really small. It's one of my favorite paintings that I've ever done and I'm keeping it for my, <coughs> myself, obviously. But, you know, this has influences from Shishkin. Uh, this painting I did, you know, two years ago. And when I was looking at this painting, I was looking a lot at some forest interiors by Ivan Shishkin. Well, and I think that's a really great idea is the, the idea being that you, you say, okay, I really want to learn how Shishkin painted. You start out by copying some Shishkins. And then you say, okay, I'm going to do an original composition, but I'm going to try to make it everything about what I learned from Shishkin. Or, you know, or whomever. And of course, one of the other benefits is that when you're cop you, you walk into a museum and you see a painting you would love to have, if you can do a master copy of that and have it hanging in your home, I have a master copy of a Rembrandt that Eric Johnson did that is spectacular that it's hanging in my office. And I, you know, I'm never going to own a Rembrandt. You know, you could, if I had a billion dollars, I probably couldn't own one. So this is For the next question. Right? I'm sorry? For a billion, you might. Yeah, uh, well, I don't think I'd pay a billion for anything. Oh, first yeah. off, I, I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I just realized in the edge of my screen, you can see another little copy that I have hanging in my studio, this little uh, Fontaine Latour. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. And I have a, you know, I got really lucky. I found a period frame that a friend was giving away that uh, it fit that size. Okay. So, so what I want to do is ask people to uh, put your questions in the chat, but also... I want everybody who is in the chat to make a commitment before Christmas. I want to see one master copy. It can be small. Pick one painting that you love from any master. I want to see one master copy and give me a yes. If you're willing to commit. All right. 
Well, get them going here, Patrick. You're inspiring a lot of people. Awesome. Yeah, I, you know, I was thinking of doing a little challenge myself for uh, the month of January to do a master copy a day, just to, it's just to sort of more, more so portraits, I'd say, because you know I do focus mostly on landscape paintings, but you know I think my portraiture is kind of lacking of you know where I would want it to be, but. Uh, oh, yeah. getting a lot of yeses. Oh, that's awesome. Right. Everyone's everyone's about to become a better painter. So we'll we'll uh, we'll post this, Patrick, and we'll we'll uh, put your name on the Instagram post that basically is it's the uh, master copy before Christmas challenge, and we'll give away a prize. We'll come up with a prize. Awesome. Any any ideas on what the prize should be? I don't know. I, I don't I don't usually know what goes for uh, prizes. All right. Well, maybe we'll maybe a nice brush set. Say that again. Maybe some nice brushes. That, yeah. That's one thing I've actually uh, picked up on doing the beer stat master copy that I had just been finishing at the Met. I wish I had the painting in the studio, but I need to pick it up on Friday. That's going to be our closing reception. And one thing I learned is that the way he applied paint with his brushes and, you know, I was, you know, looking at the painting in person, I think, just on Monday was our last session and I went in on the session and I think I spent two hours just looking at the painting, just looking at all the little different parts of the painting, looking at the texture. There are things I had already noticed about that Beerstadt painting, uh, the use of his texture in the mountains versus the foliage of the trees. And one of the big conclusions I came to is the way he was actually painting those was, uh, Probably not too dissimilar from Bob Ross in a sense. So oh, that's scary. Well, but there's, there's, um, this is what I mean by that. So if you, because I went and watched a Bob Ross video like that night, and Bob Ross uses his brushes very indirectly. You know, when I went to the academy, I used a lot of filbert brushes, brushes that were, uh, you know, like this shape. Yeah. Right. Uh, thicker on one side, thinner on the other. And I basically just used these brushes. And it didn't even occur to me to use uh, large brushes, like, you know, these large painter flats like this. I think I think Beerstadt used a brush like this to paint his entire sky, to be honest. Oh. And then, you know, the texture that he got in the rocks, he was using a lot of big brushes, a lot of dabbing, a lot of uh, going like this. He wasn't going... A lot like this but you know he's loading his paintbrush up and applying the paint in very particular ways if you have not had a chance to see it uh look at some beer stat studies because all those big paintings were done from the studies because he didn't do those big ones on location but right. a friend of mine has a collection of beer stat studies and they are to die for uh, they're just absolutely incredible because you can you know they're not as refined they're rough they're you know just trying to get indications which is what a lot of us do, but they're really worth seeing. Yeah. They're at, at the Metropolitan. You can only see some of his studies in the visible storage wing, which yeah. is kind of just a shame. Like they need to update that part. Yeah. Well, that's not, you know, only crazy people like us like studies. So Patrick, <laughs> I just want to mention one thing. I'm going to interrupt you and then we'll come back and we'll wrap it up. But uh, we are going to paint in the exact spot where Bierstadt painted his famous paintings in Estes Park, uh, the National Park, Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. We are going there. The plein air convention is going to be in Colorado this year, and we're going there uh, in May. And uh, this is not that particular scene, but that is in uh, Estes Park. But we're going to be painting Estes Park, the Garden of the Gods, uh, a number of other areas. And we got special permission because the National Park Service has changed all their rules about painters in their parks. And after COVID, it's become almost impossible to go there on your own to paint. Uh, and certainly not groups over, I don't know, 10 people or 15 people. And we have worked very hard with the National Park Service because we said this is a historic event and it's an important event. And so they've granted us special permission to go into the park we're going to be painting uh, the plein air convention basically is people painting on stage and then they're painting 
um, on location every day together. And there's an expo hall, there's beginner's day, there's all kinds of things going on. So check that out. That's the plein air convention. I also uh, want to just mention to you guys that we have an event coming up, even though this, uh, this is not about uh, watercolor. We have an event coming up in January called watercolor live. And I think it's something you might want to see. So I have a confession to make, and the confession is that I am uh, primarily an oil painter. I, I cut my teeth on oil painting. I've been oil painting for a long, long time, and I was very resistant to watercolor painting, quite frankly. But, you know, I've gotten to that point where every time I want to paint, I don't want to go to all the effort. And uh, when we did Watercolor Live, the first time I got, like, totally enthusiastic about watercolor painting – and I watched as much of it as I could as the host, which isn't a lot of time. And then, of course, last year. And it has changed my life. I've become a, a watercolor painter. I'm also an oil painter. I'm also a pastel painter now. And that makes things more interesting. But, you know, like Saturday, I, I had like a, a brief moment of time where I had, to, had a chance to go out. And I didn't have two hours or three hours. So I just grabbed my easel and my watercolors, I didn't have to put out any colors. It was already in the tray, and I just painted, and 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 satisfactory. So I, you know, I was thinking about some trips that I've got planned, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe I'll just take watercolor now because I'm having so much fun with them. I did a lot of watercolor in our New Zealand trip, and I also did oil. But what would happen is I, you know, I'd be painting with other people, and I'd paint two or three oil paintings in a very short period of time, you know, three hours or so, because I wanted to get a lot of different content for future paintings. And then people weren't done yet. So I had, you know, half an hour, I whip out my watercolor sketchbook and did two or three watercolors. And so it is really worthwhile. Uh, we have people who teach a lot of different styles and approaches, and you can get tight, you can get loose, you can do portraits, you can do landscapes, you can do flowers, you can do anything. And we're covering all that on Watercolor Live. And I hope you'll You'll join us. Now we're back to Patrick Okersinski. Ok Did I get it right? You got it right. Yeah. And, and uh, your buddy, Leo Mancini, uh, just sent me a text and he says, you're a straight up guy and one of the better painters. And he's really proud of you for doing this. Oh, Leo. Gosh, I only have good things to say about Leo. He's been yeah. one of the, uh, there weren't a lot of landscape painters when I was in the Academy. Yeah. But Leo sort of came out of the same school that I did. He went to Florence. I went to the U.S. And so from very early on, he's been one of the greatest guys. And if anyone's, you know, interested, and in, I think he said that you're, you've you been really enjoying his Mako supply, huh? Oh, well, I was going to tell you, and we'll talk about this. He's not really marketing this heavily yet, and he'll mm -hmm. probably be upset that we tell all these people about it. But his panels yeah. are absolutely incredible. They're called Mako it's Mako.com, I think, uh, Mako panels. And uh, he's only uh, providing them to a handful of artists at the moment because 
he's not really set up for the demand, but he's doing some on aluminum and he's doing others on foam and so on. And I took him to New Zealand with me. I took both his and I also took multimedia artboard panels with me, which were also wonderful. And uh, they, I just, I love them. And what I love about it is, you know, I, I was painting with uh, TM Nicholas who came up to my place this summer and, you know, we're all painting little nine by twelves and he's painting 30 by forties on location. And I, that inspired me. And he said, well, you got to try these Mako panels. And so I ordered a bunch of those big ones from Leo. And I did, I, I did some this summer that, that I just loved and I'm doing 30 by forties in two hours instead of nine by twelves in two hours. So that's really fun. Nice. So anyway, uh, we'll try to find Leo's website and post it in the, in the comments. So maybe he'll sell you guys some panels. Yeah. Leo's been great. And all right, Patrick, what else have you got that you want to discuss about copies before we go? Any, any particular thing? He's looking around, looking around well, for ideas. <laughs> okay. I guess, uh, you know, the only things that I have here that I didn't really cover are some of the more uh, portrait copies that I did. I yeah, just, let's let's so, do that. OK, I put up uh, just to show how many how often and how many copies I've actually done. I have this sergeant. I have uh, this other sergeant that I always really liked. Had the Span Spaniard, I think. And this like Dennis Miller bunker. A bunch of other sergeants. You know, Carolus Duran. I don't know this guy's name. I don't know her name either. That one, that one was, I think it was Jerome. Oh. Not that one, the, the man with the mustache. Oh, this is a painting of Jerome? Yeah. Oh, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> the mustache. And I mean, you know, I just, these are only the ones that I could find over a very small amount of time. You know, this was a single Beautiful. session for Rembrandt. I guess, I guess one of the other things about copying that I found to be really helpful and very much so for me, when I was a student, I would be painting all day long and then, you know, you get kind of tired or exhausted and copying was almost a little trick of how to keep yourself engaged because when I was doing uh, figure studies or, you know, portraits from life, sitting down at the end of the day and you know, having something that you could easily work on in the comfort of your own home in your studio, whether it was just a pencil sketch in my sketchbook or whether I was taking out my paints, there's something about copying where it's almost energizing. I, I don't know how to explain it. Well, and, it, and it's changing your mindset. I think that one of the nice things I'm trying to do this more is I, I want to get some of those wall easels. Uh, Jack Richardson sells them. And that way I can have two or three easels in a small space. And I want to have a station set up for pastel, one for watercolor, one for oil, so that I can just move from one to the other if I get bored. But I think it'd be cool to have one of those stations be, you know, always have a master copy going because it's a great way. You know, sometimes when you get tired and you lose your energy, if you keep, you want to keep painting, but you, you start making stupid mistakes, then you screw up your painting. This way you could kind of take a break, go over to something, learn something new, and then you're making master copies. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. So are, are there any other questions in the chat? Maybe I could. No, I think the only other question is the same question I asked you when, when we first met, and that is how did you get to be so good at such a young age? <laughs> well, I, I, I think I credit a lot to master copying because I think that was one of the biggest differences that I saw me doing versus other students. Yeah. And particularly the way I was doing master copies is I wasn't just blindly doing these copies. I had very specific questions on what I wanted to learn and what I wanted to improve on. I, I did you know tons of drawings that I also have stored away of master copies, like more finished drawings. A big part of it was that I went to the Florence Academy of Art in the US, which is no longer active. And so the teachers sort of split up. It's still active in uh, in Florence, Italy, but now there's also the Grand Central Atelier and the Lime Academy. Uh, well, the the teach the, the teachers went to the Lime Academy. Some of them so did anyway. My my teachers are now yeah. at the Lime Academy. Yeah, more. and they're doing a great job there. We just did a story on them in Fine Art Connoisseur. 
Well, Patrick, uh, I should mention that you've started doing, you just did your first plein air event, which was in Sonoma. Congratulations on that. And uh, we're going to be seeing you around. I, I want everybody to to give Patrick a round of applause. It's not easy to get on camera and talk in front of all these people. And you did a great job today. You taught us something, you inspired us, and we're all going to keep an eye on you. And we're going to start seeing you at more plein air events. We're going to start seeing you in the the higher end galleries. I mean, you look at the quality of your work, your original work, it's spectacular. And you have a, a long and bright career ahead of you. And we're all very proud of you. Gosh, thank you so much, Eric. It's really been a pleasure, you know, being here with you today. And this is the first time I've ever done a live stream. So hopefully I didn't mess that up too much. But it's <laughs> no, you didn't mess up. You're doing a great job. You're very composed. All awesome. right. Thank you, Patrick. So our guest today, Patrick Okersinski. I think I got it and uh, give him a thumbs up, applause, share. And remember, we're going to do a master copy challenge, master copy, any master. Uh, let's make it a dead master. Okay. That way we're not copying any living masters, a dead master copy before Christmas, which means you don't have a lot of time because you're going to be shopping and looking for my gift which is going to, you know, it's going to take all your time to find something that special. Just saying, no, don't do that. Um, thank you for watching. Thanks to Patrick. Uh, get signed up for Watercolor Live. It is just exploding, and we're really, really going to have a good time with that. Looking forward to it. As a matter of fact, we, we've been, we've changed some things. We've got some new things happening, and I just previewed some of it yesterday, my tech team got me on a call and they showed me some cool new stuff we're going to be doing. And, uh, but most important, you're going to get a lot out of it. You're going to become a watercolorist or a better watercolorist and have a lot of opportunity to learn. That's coming up in late January. So get signed up because prices continue to escalate. As a matter of fact, they went up on Thanksgiving day. So the next price increase is coming up. So you want to make sure you get in there. All right. Thank you for watching, and this is Art School Live. I'm Eric Rhodes. Have a great day.